This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 65, My Depressed Teen Refuses Therapy, How Do I Help? I always remember you saying it's right around this time of year where you would get a lot more people showing up asking for help. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, I've always done my billing by hand. I actually keep a written ledger and, you know, I, I, it's a little old fashioned. And so I can see how far down a page each month goes. And I remember, um, especially when I was practicing a lot, that suddenly January and then February, I would go so much further down the page than I did in other months. It's it's tough. Um, it's a hard point in the school year mm. under normal conditions. Um, the weather's bad. The days are short. The light is rare. Um, people feel it, yeah. really feel it in January and February. I think there are a lot of people struggling just to find somebody they could talk to, a, a medical professional that they could talk to. And we got this letter that really caught our attention talking about a depressed teen who needs help. My son is 17 and in the 12th grade. His high school experience has been anything but normal due to heavy lockdowns in Ontario. He's apathetic and spends all his time gaming or on his phone and has few connections in the non-virtual world. He has very little motivation to prepare for college or to even think about what a gap year would look like. We've tried many approaches, including a virtual therapy session, which he claimed was not needed. He's adamant that he does not want therapy, so I feel we're really hitting a wall right now. And of course, the more I encourage him to open up or to seek help, the more he withdraws. We're here to support him and encourage, but I feel like I'm at a total loss. Do you have any recommendations? Lisa, how do you you get a kid who doesn't want to go to therapy to get help? It's so hard. And this, Rena, this letter, I am hearing this story everywhere. And I'm hearing it in different versions. There's kids who... You know, like like the kids in Ontario where the lockdowns have actually been pretty intense, who, you know, just have checked out from the world outside their rooms. And then there's kids who go to school, but school's not that fun, Raina. I mean, it's just, it's really, um, you know, it's so important to wear masks, and yet they, they just take the fun out of a lot of it, you know, just the playful aspects of school. And so kids are pretty reserved, I'm noticing, or checked out. And then the other thing I'm noticing is kids who are really scared that the schools are going to close. And so they are they don't feel like teenagers at school. You know, usually teenagers at school, there's a little action, there's a little friction. Whereas what I'm seeing are kids who are very sedate, very compliant, because I think they're scared that the schools might close and like whatever else, they just want to be in school. And it's just um, this story Rena is so many family story of of looking at a teenager and thinking, kid, you are so not yourself. You are so yeah. suffering. You are in so much pain. Yeah. And like, let me help you or let me get you to help. And the kid basically, you know, stonewalling on it. And it's terrible, Rena. It's terrible. Okay, so what do you do? So what do you do? So the first thing I would say, I'm going to throw out like every idea I can think of just because I think one thing will work for one family, another thing mm-hmm. might work for another family. Mm-hmm. So the first thing you can do, if you can find a therapist, and we will come back to that, is reach out to a clinician who cares for teenagers and get guidance from them. Ask them for a session or two. And there's a few things that can happen when you do this. One is you can meet with them, and they might have good ideas about how to help your kid. Though I'll also try to come up with some ideas about what you can do before you even meet with a clinician. But get them thinking with you about, you know, have you tried this at home? Have you tried that at home? Another thing that clinicians help with, and I will help with this in this episode, is how to talk to teens about coming into therapy and and kind of lower the barrier to that. And then the third thing that can be really great is if you're successful and your teen can go see that therapist and you can back all the way out, Now that therapist is kind of hitting the ground running with your teen, you know, they've gotten a background on your teen, they understand them a little bit, and that can then grease the wheels if a therapy gets up and running. So 
One option is just to try to locate a clinician. And actually, given how hard it is to get in with clinicians these days, mm-hmm. especially people who see teenagers, I would do it like to get on someone's calendar while you're working on getting your teen open to the idea. Oh. Like, get that slot, hold that space. And even if it means getting on their waiting list for you to have the beaning with them, wow. that is tactical at this point. So walk me through this. If I'm the teen and, I'm, and you're my mom, and I'm like, mom, that's just so stupid. I'm not going to go talk to some stranger about how I feel. I'm not going. If you have that resistance, how do you respond? You totally nailed it, right? This is how teenagers feel. And, you know, frankly, Rena, let's acknowledge it is a somewhat bizarre arrangement. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to walk in <laughs> and talk to this random person. And I will tell you, actually, have you ever watched um, Dog the Bounty Hunter? No. Okay. You know what it is? I, I do know about him. Yes. The show where he's like hunting down criminals, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. No. So Dog the Bounty Hunter is like this giant human who looks kind of like a WWF like, yeah. wrestler type guy. And his job, he goes and finds people who have like fled bail jumped yeah. bail and he has yeah. to bring him back. And you know, I was like flipping through channels one night and like kind of stopped on Dog the Bounty Hunter. I was like, let's just check this out. <sighs> and no, he taught me something that I have used clinically for what? years with teenagers what? who land in my office. So here's what happens. So Dog like, you know, knocks on, you know, some perp's <laughs> door and the guy opens the door and he says to him, look, you don't know me and I don't know you, but we have to leave together. So we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that is like brilliant, brilliant. So, OK, so here I am, five foot four myself in my you know, like, little shiny office. When a teenager can get to my office and we will help families figure out how to make that happen. And they are sitting there looking at me like, lady, I don't you know, why would I talk to you? I use I channel dog the bounty hunter and I say to them, look, you do not know me. I do not know you. I know this is very strange. I am here to try to be of use. I want to be helpful to you, but I know that this is a really weird scenario. And it works, Rena, because teenagers are like, okay, so you're not going to pretend like this is normal. You're not going to like just try to be like nice to me until I soften. And so I just want you (laughs) you to know (laughs) that... That that piece matters. Okay. But how do you get them in the door? How do you even get them to a clinician who can try the dog, the bounty hunter move on them? Okay. So what I always think about in these moments is something that was said to me in my training, which at the time I thought that can't be true. And now I think it's 100% true. And it was one of my supervisors who said to me, you need to operate with the idea that every teenager secretly worries that they're crazy. What? Those are words. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And that's how, that's how I reacted when she said it. I was like, oh, come on. Like, that yeah. doesn't seem likely. But I actually think it was spot on. And here's why, right? So you're, you know, 10, 11, you're a pretty steady person. Like, you don't get that, you know, upset about anything. And all of a sudden, like, wham, 12, 13, your feelings go through the roof. We've covered this in a million ways on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know, wham, 14, your mind is changing. You see things in, like, very exciting but also very complex ways. And it's a lot. And they can feel pretty internally disorganized. And so there is this kind of harboring this worry of, like, what's wrong with me that I think we have to always assume lives in every teenager. And so then when a grown-up's like, you know what you need? You need therapy. Mm. The kid's like, oh, no, it's true. Like, I'm broken. Or I mean, So with that framing in mind, one way to approach this is to say to a teenager – Look, this is not about you being broken. This is about you deserving support that I'm not equipped to give you or I don't know how to offer right now. And there has never been a better time to say this to teenagers because it's so bad right now for so many of them that you can really say this like with no, you know, qualifications or reservations. You can say, look, you have been through a horrible two years. Anybody in your shoes yeah, would yeah. be you know, you deserve more support than I can get you, like, or I can provide here, like, let's get you a pro. So that can help as one way to try to um, reframe it. So it doesn't seem to them about being damaged. And instead is quite a bit more accurately about them deserving more support than they have. 
Wow. I love that line. You deserve more support than I can give you. Yep. Lisa, we're going to pause for a second. I want to ask you about the problem when we come back on the other side of this break about if you can't find therapist or even just finding one. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Ask Lisa podcast. We're talking about trying to get your teens into therapy. And Lisa, before we talk about what do you do if your kid actually wants to go to therapy, but you can't find someone, do you have any other ideas about that stubborn teen who just doesn't feel ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. So a few more things that can work. Another thing is that, you know, as this this parent wrote in this letter, I mean, her son's depressed. She, you know, it's very clear that this young man is depressed. And one of the symptoms of depression is feeling hopeless, feeling like mm. nothing's going to help, like nothing's going to make a difference. And so one of the most powerful lines that parents have at their disposal is to say, you know, if, if you say to a kid, you, you really, I want you to talk to somebody, and they're like, nothing's going to help, it's not going to make a difference, it's really important to say back, that's your depression talking. And when your depression is treated, you won't feel that way. So let's get your depression treated. But wait a second, going back to your point about how teens kind of feel like they might be going crazy, doesn't it like take them down a rabbit hole by saying you're depressed? Like, doesn't that then That's like, a good point. That's a good point. Make right? them freak if, out. Like, it would make me freak out if you yeah. were my mom and you said, Yo, you're depressed. I'm like, what? I'm depressed? I'm not yeah. depressed. That's a good point. I, so I guess, you know, let's think it through. I know it's a good line, but I think you'd really want to establish with a kid first, you know, I'm worried that you might be depressed. You have every reason to be depressed. It mm. makes sense. And, you know, this is so not like you. You know that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think if it's if you have a kid who's just really shut down, who is, um, you know, not engaging the world at all, I think you could probably say, you know, this isn't like you at all. And I, I worry you're depressed and you feeling like this won't help. That's the depression talking. Let's get that treated. Um, but I think that's right, Rena. Like, we have to be really careful when using diagnostic terminology around teenagers, when offering medication to teenagers, um, because again, that, you know, even though it can often be a great thing for a lot of teenagers that are like, oh, man, now I need pills, like definitely I'm broken. So mm -hmm. I, I thank you for pointing that out because I, I, we have to tread so carefully around those kinds of things. There's there's one other thing I want parents to have as a, as a line, right? I mean, it's so interesting. A lot of being a good clinician is just having your, you know, your effective language for trying to communicate. And so I think about this boy and I think about this parent who wrote and this boy has come up in some ways with his own solution. He's, you know, on his phone, he's in his room, he's, you know, he's trying to cope in ways that really reveal how much he's suffering. And and the parent might say, look, I, I want you to talk to a therapist. And he's like, no, 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 I got it. And I would have the parent say, say back something like, look, what you're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do something else. Mm -hmm. And therapy is what I can think of. If you've got ideas, I'm open to them, but I'm putting therapy on the table as one idea here. So I would have parents move in all of those spaces. And, and I just want to say before we move on to anything else, you can ask your kid if you're really worried about if your kid might harm themselves or is thinking about them, that you can ask. And asking kids does not give them this idea. That's something that people worry about sometimes. And so whatever else, it's also okay to say to your teenager if you have reason to worry, like, this has been such a hard time. Are you worried at all about your ability to stay safe? Do I need to worry about your ability to keep yourself safe? And and get an answer to that question. And if your teen's unsure about their safety, call your pediatrician or take them to the ER. That piece, you move on fast. Wow. Getting them into a therapy, you can work on that. But if you have any reason to be concerned about safety, get an answer to that question from your teen. Wow. I never thought about asking them just directly because you kind of think as a parent, oh my gosh, if he's going to harm or she's going to harm herself, I, I I need to do this quietly with a, a clinician of some sort. But you're saying, ask the question, just ask them. Yeah. And we have data showing that it, kids often actually are glad you asked, you know, especially kids who are in, um, in danger. There, there are some data showing that they actually appreciated that somebody asked them. So mm, it, I think if wow. you ask it in that way where you say, look, anyone in your shoes would really feel pretty 
you know, pretty low. Um, and, you know, you can even say this may feel like a weird question to ask, but, you know, I love you and I got to ask it. Like, uh, do we need to be worried about your safety here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, what do you do if you can't get in somewhere or, you know, if you're, if you want somebody of a particular race right. or religion or gender and you just can't find that, like, what do you do? Rena, this is the part, honestly, that's breaking my heart more than anything, right? It, it's, you know, hard enough to get a teen to therapy, but now to find a clinician, first of all, there's not that many of us who see teens and then to find a clinician who's available. So here are the strategies I would have parents consider. One is call your pediatrician again, because pediatricians are plugged into the local talent clinically. They're often collegial with those people, and sometimes they can help you in. Right. They can they can call a colleague and say, look, I, I've known this kid forever. This is, a, you know, I, I want you to see this child. Is there any way you can squeeze him in? So that can happen. Same with your school counselors. If you feel comfortable mm-hmm. sharing with your school that you're looking for somebody, um, mm-hmm. they can sometimes, you know, make a call, fast track things, push things along. So I would just say use your resources as much as you can. Um, another option that I want people to consider, you know, is to just start calling, right, and getting on waiting lists. Mm-hmm. And um, don't hesitate to get on a waiting list. You know, you may come up much faster than you thought you would. Um, and then there's something else that is new. And the consumer side of it is not as worked out as it should be, but it's very promising. And it's that there is now a national license available for psychologists. Oh. So, yeah, this is fascinating. So the way it's always been is you're licensed in the state where you practice. So I am licensed in the state of Ohio. And until recently, I could only care for people who were sitting physically in the state of Ohio while I was sitting physically in the state of Ohio. Maybe I could be out of town, but like they had to be in Ohio. And prior to the pandemic, Psychologists, I mean, bluntly, we kind of looked down our nose at mental health, at telehealth. We were like, ah, no, it's not the same. Then, of course, it turns out it's fine. It works great. You know, it often helps people get into therapy that they don't have to deal with the logistics of getting to an office. And so in a, in a kind of stunning and wonderful development, a group called PSYPACT, P-S-Y-P-A-C-T, put together all of the back end needed to develop a license that let you lets you practice across straight, state lines. Wow. And what it comes down to is state legislatures enacting this. And as it stands right now, I think 27 states and the District of Columbia have enacted this law. And I think there's a few more where it's in process. Mm-hmm. And so then psychologists who are interested, and I did this even though I'm not taking anyone new into my practice, can, it took like a week of my life to apply for the license. I mean, I'm dragging out my you know, supervision stuff from when I was in my mid-20s. I mean, it's, it's sort of amazing. <laughs> but I have this license now, and I use it to actually care for um, teenagers who I saw in my practice who are now college students in other states. Oh, and so wow. when this is really up and running – what it means is you are not limited anymore to your local talent. And so I've actually been in touch with the SIPAC people asking, you know, when will there be a searchable directory that parents can go in and search for people who specialize in adolescence and, you know, can see them, you know, wherever they are. And so parents can start to pay attention to this. I would have you look on the SIPAC website just to see if your state's already passed the legislature. I'd have you push your state if they haven't. Mm -hmm. But that's another Mm -hmm. option. I just want consumers to be aware of because it's happened very quietly, but it's kind of a game changer, Rena. Wow. That is a huge game changer because then it opens up, you know, if there's a particular person or or a set of experiences or something that you want, yes. then you could search that. Yes. That's great. Lisa, can we put that in our show notes as well? Absolutely. For people, that website, Absolutely. Uh, for people who want more. I want to go back to this letter because this parent says this child is in the 12th grade, Lisa, and this is such an important year where things matter. I know she, the, the parents said they're thinking about maybe trying to get this teen to think about a gap year or something, but I do feel like the sands of time here are mm-hmm. running out. Mm-hmm. That when that window, like, what do you suggest if you're sort of in those later years of high school and you really want to get this right? You know, I think I would just push really hard on 
trying to get this kid back on track yeah. and, and back engaged with the world. And and it gets to this other idea. So I, of course, I'm a big fan of therapy. I'd love to see this kid in therapy. My view of what is therapeutic has expanded a lot the longer I have practiced. How so? Well, what we want for some kids is therapy. And some kids, absolutely, that has to happen. But I've also watched kids make all the changes I wanted to see made because they joined a theater program or because they started volunteering at a local animal shelter or because they got a job or because they um, started exercising when they hadn't been exercising or because they got much more serious about not having tech in their bedrooms and were able to get a good night's sleep. And so... Back to that idea of saying to this boy, look, what's happening here is not working. Something has to change. Mm -hmm. I do think with or without therapy, parents should say, we need to come up with some things that you're going to try to help yourself feel better, whether it's that you're out getting fresh air for an hour a day or you're exercising or you start, you know, helping down the block with this family who's got young kids and they're sort of overwhelmed. But pushing for this idea that what teenagers need, really need, is to be engaged in the world beyond their own heads. And what the pandemic has made so painfully obvious is that when you rob teenagers of that outside world, when they take all of that attention and focus and energy and it gets catalyzed inward, it's not good for them. Like, they need to be pulled out. And so I would, while waiting for therapy or alongside therapy, try to be as creative as absolutely possible in light of the conditions created by the pandemic to get your kid, to get this kid back into the world. Like, I would love for this guy to have a job. Like, a job right now would be a game changer, I think, for this kid, if that's an option, which, of course, is the big question right now. Can I tell you, that's just great advice for everybody, that you need to get engaged beyond your own head. Mm -hmm. So many of us are at home, and we might be working or dealing with the kids or the family, but finding things to be engaged with beyond just your house, I guess, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so, so important. Before we go, Lisa, I want to ask you, at what point do you feel that parents should be really worried if they find themselves with a teen who's super depressed? Definitely, if there's any question about safety. That is the, you know, that is the red line. That is something that needs to be taken very seriously. And I think, you know, you should be worried if it's getting in the way of what we call progressive development. You know, if they're not growing as a person. You know, the 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 heart of adolescence is that they're growing, right? They just change so fast and they're expanding their capacities and they're moving out into the world. And that has been so badly disrupted by the pandemic. And yet a lot of teenagers are still figuring out ways to grow. They're thriving academically or they're still being creative in their own ways. But if your kid looks stalled developmentally, which I think a lot of kids are going to look that way right now, Mm -hmm. that's concerning. And and you want to Work with them, work with your resources to get very, very creative about how to get them moving forward developmentally again, even if it's not in the ways we would have normally seen Mm -hmm. it or at the rate we would have normally Mm -hmm. seen it. Wow. That's really, really good. Uh, There's just so much to digest here. I I just can't get over it. So Lisa, what do you have for us for Parenting to Go this week? For Parenting to Go, what I want parents to help teenagers appreciate is that their distress makes sense. You know, it makes me think about our episode from the start of the year where, you know, we said one of our resolutions is to expect distress. And I think that for teenagers, they can start to feel so divorced and alien from the world when they're unhappy. And when we can say to them, you know, I think so many people are suffering right now and especially so many people your age are suffering right now, There's nothing wrong with you. This is not a sign that, you know, there's something about you that doesn't make sense. This makes a ton of sense. Let's get you the support you deserve. Mm. I still can't get over that you watch Dog the Bounty Hunter. (laughs) You know, I will take wisdom wherever I find it. (laughs) That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And Lisa, next week we're going to talk about whether you should bribe your kid. I'll see you next week. See you next week.
Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to Lisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.